So continuing on with our one bit platformer, now that we can damage a object or an enemy, uh, we do want to remove the projectile as soon as it does damage in this case. And also we'd like to change the enemy to be able to have uh, like a death animation, which we already kind of set up in the animated sprite. Um, but actually switching to that death animation when the enemy reaches zero health. Also, when the enemy is at zero health, it should no longer be damageable. Uh, while it's being removed from the scene, which should occur a couple seconds after it dies. So uh, let's close that. Let's go to the projectile window, the basic projectile. And I'm going to say on the projectile script, let's add an export variable. So this will be export var remove on hit, which is going to be a Boolean set to true, of course. So if we want the projectile to remove itself as soon as it hits another target, then we have this in here. So for that to work, we have to connect to the hitbox. So we'll add in a at export var hitbox, which is going to take a hitbox 2D. And whenever this hitbox is assigned, we want to connect to its uh, hit signal. Well, we haven't really created a hit signal, but basically when it hits a target, we should have a signal that it dealt damage to the target. So in here, I'll put in signal um, hit and let's say target which is going to be a hurt box 2D for now. And then we'll say the amount. So the amount of damage that it dealt, if any. So when our hit box connects to a hurt box, we first we make sure it's a hurt box. And then maybe as another condition, we want to set that the hurt box is actually hittable. So if it is a hurt box, then we'll add in another check. We'll say um, not hurt box dot get hittable, let's say. So a hurtbox script will be able to define if it is hittable or not. And if it's not hittable, then we'll return before we actually deal damage to it. So that means we need to jump into the hurtbox script. So I'll right click here for the symbol, look up symbol, and then let's add in the function get hittable, which of course is going to return a Boolean whether it's hittable or not. And for now, let's say return stats.current health is greater than zero. If the current health is above zero, it's hittable. Otherwise, it's not, and we'll ignore it for projectiles hitting the target. Okay, now in the hitbox, we'll emit the signal hit if the target took damage. So let's say down here, we'll take the uh, weapon stats dot damage and assign it to damage dealt like this. Then we'll replace weapon stats dot damage with damage dealt, and we'll say hit dot emit and the target of the hurt box with the amount, which is damage dealt. I'll make sure that's spelled correctly as well. So damage underscore D-E-A-L-T, no H, replace all. Okay, that should clean that up. Uh, so now uh, there's gonna be this hit signal that gets emit whenever the target successfully takes damage. And we wanna connect to this on the basic projectile. So go to the basic projectile script. So we need to connect to the hit signal on the hit box. You can do that when uh, the script is ready on ready, um, or you could do it when the hitbox is set, which is usually kind of my preferred method at the moment. So I'm gonna add a colon here and we'll add a setter for the property. So set value, when we set a value to the hitbox, we want to uh, set the hitbox to the value. So as it is right now, nothing's changed, but we want to unsubscribe from the old hitbox and subscribe to the new hitbox's hit signal. So if instance valid is instance valid of the current hitbox, then we'll disconnect from its hit signal. So hitbox.hit.disconnect on hit. And then down here, if uh, is instance valid on the new hitbox, because remember we just assigned that right here, then we'll connect to it, hitbox.hit dot connect underscore on hit so now we need this on hit uh callback function on hit and when we get hit according to the hitbox script we get a target and an amount as a parameter so we want those same parameters in this function so p target is going to be a herd box 2d and then the other one is p amount which is the damage we took and we can pass that for right now so the amount here isn't exactly that clear. So I could say health changed or health change, P health change. And then we go back to the hitbox and I'm gonna put health change there just to make it more clear exactly what this is. So the target gets hit 
and then its health changes by an amount. And I think that's just a little bit more clear of a name. So when the target gets hit, uh, we're just going to remove this projectile from the scene. So we'll do, you could do Q3, which is probably preferable um, because this gives uh, everything else in the scene until the end of the frame to interact with this projectile and then it will clear itself up. So to remove itself from the scene, usually I think you wanna do Q3 over free uh, because this will make it so that anything else trying to interact with this projectile has a chance until the end of the current frame to finish its operations and then it queues free at, and then it frees the object or removes it from the scene at the safe time uh, rather than freeing it immediately with free, which usually works but it may, I guess, lead to stuff like missing references to the object which no longer exists in the scene, but this removes it safer. That's generally my understanding. We could, of course, go right-click and remove and kind of read through it. So yeah, it just gives it a second to be accessed until it's deleted is the general idea there. So it'll remove itself at the end of the frame. Okay, we need to assign the hitbox and the basic projectile script. If you wanted to, um, you could make it like an array of hitboxes and then do this for each one of them. Uh, I think almost every projectile on every game is only gonna need one hurt box. So we'll just keep it simple for right now. Yeah, just assign the one hurt box. So now we wanna test if this is working. Um, I'm gonna set a breakpoint right there and see if this part hits. I'll hit play. We shoot at the guy there. It gets Q freed. So that's gonna mean that that projectile is gone from the scene. But if the enemy is already dead, then you can see that our projectiles pass right through it. So that's when we should play the death animation on the enemy and then remove it from the scene once that animation is done. So let's see, we can put the signal on the resource object stats. That's often a good idea because a resource is easily shareable between objects throughout your scenes as long as you have some reference to this. It's easier to share resources than it is to share nodes because a node has to exist in the same scene in order to grab its reference. So uh, let's go into object stats and create a signal. So signal, what should we call it? Signal death, signal out of health. I guess we'll just go with signal death. You could pass in a value like the current health, but I don't think that's gonna be needed. We just need to know that the object died and then we can play the animation when that occurs. So when the health is set to zero or less, uh, when the previous health was above zero, then it should play the death signal. I think that would be correct. So we'll do that with a setter. So remember, uh, colon at the end after the value, and then set, and with parentheses, the parameter value. And uh, we're going to get the old value first. So old is going to be equal to current health. And then we set the current health to the new value equals value. And then if the old let's say old is greater than zero and current health is less than or equal to zero, then the character just died or the object just died. So we'll say death.emit, hit save. I think that's pretty much all we need there. Yep, so we have this death signal and we can react to it now. So in the platformer character 2D script, every platformer character, if its health drops, we want it to receive that death signal. So we'll need a reference to the object stats. So in our uh, platformer character 2D script, remember we still haven't made this invader a enemy script. It's still just a platformer character. Then uh, we will grab a reference to the resource we need. So at export var, uh, let's say stats. Yeah, we could just call it stats for right now. And we probably will be calling this like character stats at some point. Uh, yeah, we could just create character stats right now. So this doesn't exist yet. We need to extend the script under objects, characters. I'm going to right click here and let's create a new script. We're going to call it character stats. And this is going to inherit from object stats because it's going to contain the same health that an object would. And in character stats, we'll give it the class name character stats. And we're going to leave it alone for right now. Now back in invader, we'll just save this script again and if we click back on the script we might need to reload but it should pop up here so let's reload the project if you don't see it in the inspector and there we have our character stats so character stats inherits from object stats so if we do a new object we can see it still has the max health and the current health so every damageable object has a health and that can include characters which could include players or enemies. So it starts from something generic and it goes up to a more specific character and then player enemy 
and probably MPC um, after that and getting more specific and accumulating the different properties along the way. And th that's basically programming inheritance in a nutshell. Okay, um, so when our platformer character dies, we want to play the death animation on it. So let's connect to the character stats signal. And I'll do that once again with a setter. So if the instance is valid on stats, uh, then I'm going to disconnect from it before I assign the new one. And the reason I've been doing this with most of my properties is just to prepare for the case that there might be a situation where you actually change the stats out or the um, property that we're setting in each of these fields with a different one. And whenever we change it, we want to make sure that we're not connected to the old signals and that we connect to the new signals. So in most cases, it's not needed because you only assign one stats to a character. So you could skip the check and just uh, connect to the stats signal directly. That would look something like stats equal value stats dot death dot connect on death. And so if you assume that in your script that you're never going to change the value, then this will work. Um, it's just that if you change it, then there's going to be an issue because you might be connected to two different objects because um, each object you assign here is going to have its own death signal and then you're connected to them, but you never disconnected from the old one. So it's just kind of uh, forward thinking, right? So if instance is valid on the current sets, then I'm going to disconnect from it. Stats.death.disconnect underscore on death. And then down here, we just kind of do this, copy paste, tab this over. And now you're disconnecting from the old one and connecting to the new one. So in the event that you change it, you're prepared for that. Um, so we need to create a on death. So function underscore death. And when that's the case, we want to play the death animation. But you know what? Now that I'm looking at it again, I think we can break this up into another script as well and just keep things even more separated into their uh, respective components where it makes the most sense. So what we want to do is change the animation. So really, instead of grabbing a reference to the animated sprite and changing it in this character script, we could actually just extend animated sprite 2D to have a connection to the character stats and then the animated sprite will handle changing its own animations. So let's uh, rename this to be character sprite 2D. Right click on it, attach a script, and we'll put this in the characters folder. Note it's inheriting from animated sprite 2D. So we'll create that. Now let's grab from the platformer character 2D script, clicking up here, and we'll just cut and paste this away into the character sprite 2D like this. And in invader, Let's grab on death, and we're going to go to the character sprite 2D again and paste that in there. So now any object that has a character sprite 2D, or, or should we even call it an object sprite? Because I guess like a tree or something would need to have a death animation too, wouldn't it? So yeah, let's make this even more generic. I'm going to rename character sprite 2D to be object sprite 2D, and we'll move that up to the objects level. And in object sprite 2D, we're going to have the on death reaction where we set the animation so class name object sprite 2d we have the connection to the signal right here and then we need to on death we're going to play the death animation so i think it might be a good idea for our game if we have consistent naming for these animations across all of our objects so that when anyone's working in the project and they open up a character and they see the list of animation names that they know exactly which animation corresponds to what so we should have a list or a resource of names for those at some point. Now, I don't remember. In uh, data, we had a groups name resource. So that would be kind of similar. We could just have a animation names resource as well. So that's what I'll go with for now. Let's right click on data, create a new script, animation names. Oh, whoops. Snake case animation names. So uh, lowercase and then separated by an underscore. Create names. Let's go into this. It's a resource, class name, animation names. And we'll need at export var death, which is a string name equal to death. Okay, now let's create that resource. Right click, create new resource animation names. And I will just call it animation names.tres. Okay, now we go back over to the character sprite 2D. And let's at export another variable at export var. Let's see, yeah. animation underscore names, which is of type animation names. 
And now when we actually play the animation, we just reference that uh, field from the resource. So let's see, a animated sprite, I think has a play method. So we play the animation name. So rather than typing in death directly here, just like before with the group names, I'm gonna do animation underscore names dot death. So once again, the reason for this is just to have consistency between all objects. So the death name isn't set locally here and the character, it's actually set in our resource here, which is kind of serving like a dictionary across our project where we share all of the and therefore every object should have the same death animation name when we're setting it up here. Otherwise we'll get some kind of error and we would actually want that so that we can keep the consistency. Okay, so we just need to do play animation names dot death on death. If we hit play and we shoot our guys a bunch, then we should get the death animation. We did not. I see some uh, error messages in the debugger. Oh, and also, it looks like these resources have not been made unique. So in errors, uh, these are just uh, notices that if you're not using something, you should make it an underscore when it's a parameter. So it's not really problematic here. You can, of course, click on each one and underscore it if you're not using it. So we could do underscore health changed. And then over here, we're not using the delta, so we could just underscore it. We do need it again. And then there's one over here. Oh yeah, ptarget is also not being used by this method specifically. So as we're making sure that uh, when you damage one target, you're not damaging all of them, for the object stats resource, we should make sure that local to scene is toggled on. Now, uh, if you wanna just make sure that that applies to all resources that are of this type, and I think we do, then we can edit the script. So I'm gonna edit that resource, and then we're gonna edit the script here. So in our object stats, if we want to force it to always be local to the scene, then we could do something like function underscore init. And whenever the resource is initialized, we'll say resource local to scene equals true. So I'll save that. We hit play. And let's shoot this guy a bunch. Okay, he's dead. And this guy a bunch. Now he's dead. So they each have a separate health now, which is more like what we would expect. Alternatively, if you still want to set that value here in the inspector and not be confused between this and this, uh, another thing you could do is say, if resource local to scene is not true, so we'll say if not resource local to scene, then we'll push, then we'll print a message. So let's say prints resource not local to scene. Um, let's do percent %s to import a string here. And then to replace that string with uh, what we want, let's do percent resource name or resource path even, resource path maybe. Okay, and remove this part. So now if we hit play and we look in the output, then we'll see that this resource uh, for the object stats of the invader is not local to the scene. So that'll just kind of be a notice that, hey, we're trying to load a object stats and it's not local to the scene, which means that we might be duplicating it across our enemies. Now, one reason to do this might be there is actually some kind of enemy that maybe shares health between different enemies. And in that outlier case, you might actually want local to scene off even for object stats. But we'll just check it here so that all of our object stats on the invaders are local. We'll hit play, and if we don't get that message, then okay, then they should be damageable separately. So that guy got hit 10 times, and this one gets hit 10 times again, and like that. So um, that's just like using a message instead of uh, forcing it. If you want it to be more like a warning, you could do like push warning, and if we toggle that off and hit play, then it'll show up in the debugger instead. So uh, in some cases, you might want to do that. So if in the case that you're never going to be like sharing object stats, the health between uh, multiple objects in your scene, like multiple enemies all sharing the same health pool, then uh, this might actually make more sense because this is more of a strong message and you'll definitely know that um, there needs to be a checkbox here so that they have separate health pools. Okay, so our character sprite 2D, uh, we can see that we didn't really get a message about the stats being uh, empty. So we never set the stats, and that means we're never going to connect to the signal. So maybe we want to require there to be a stats value. So we could say function ready. We're going to check if stats has actually been set. So if not stats, then we're going to push a warning, 
stats must be assigned. Then I'll say like uh, square brackets just to emphasize the property name. Stats must be assigned in object sprite 2D. Okay, and that should be fine. If you want, you can also do one for the, um, the animation names. If animation, if not animation names, then push warning animation names must be assigned in object sprite 2D. Well, instead of saying the name of the class, what we could do is percent %s. So we're going to replace that percent %s with a string with a percent following the string. And then we just say name, which is the name of the node. Okay, so here we'll say percent %s, and then we do percent. And then what are we replacing the percent %s with? Name. So uh, S here represents string. You can also do like D for decimal values. So if you're doing a number instead of a string, then you would just uh, put a D here and then give it a float or an integer over here instead of a string. Um, so if we hit play now, we should get some debugger messages. Okay, there we got six. So just in that little ready check, uh, we actually know that a bunch of stuff is not assigned properly inside of our scene. So kind of handy to have little checks like that, just to uh, kind of know that you haven't set up the inspector yet. So we want to copy the object stats. So I'm going to right click here, copy over to character sprite, and then we uh, paste the stats in. So we need to have character stats here. And currently the hurt box has object stats. So object stats can set a character stats, but the character stats can't set an object stat. So we actually want to create a new character stats here. And uh, we're going to check local to scene. I'm going to right click here, copy, go to hurt box and paste it in here. Okay, now they're sharing the same character stats. And animation names, we can quick load this from the project. Click the drop down, quick load, animation names from data.animationnames.tres. So there we have the death animation name, and there we have the health and current health of our enemy. If we hit play, uh, the debugger messages should go away because we properly set these values. So if I shoot this guy 10 times, well, it's not playing the death animation. So let's actually uh, toggle right here, a breakpoint on death shoot this guy a few more times and we can see it's not actually uh triggering so if we check stats we can uh, make sure that the death signal is actually emitting so i'm going to right click on the death signal look up signal we have signal death here it should emit right here so let's set a breakpoint right there when death gets emitted and i'll shoot this guy 10 times and we can see we actually hit the breakpoint so we can continue that Okay, and if I check the character sprite 2D in the inspector resource, we can see that the um, value or the ID of this resource and the ID of the other resource are not consistent. So um, I think if we save the character stats to the project, let's try going up to enemies and we'll say invader stats here, invader stats.tres. Okay then we're going to have it from the same file and it's going to be local to the scene. So let's try this character sprite. We're going to once again, load quick load the invader stats. Okay. And now let's hit play and see if those are still connected. Okay. So death emits and then we do hit the play for the on death response. Okay. So if I hit play again, Okay, good. That's exactly what we want. So this character died. These characters did not. So here's what's happening. Uh, we're loading from the invader stats on our project uh, directories. When it's loaded into these scenes, it becomes localized to the scene. And then character sprite 2D and hurtbox 2D are sharing the same file, which is a duplicated copy of the original. And that happens for each of the three invaders we create. So they each basically get their own duplicated copy, which is local to the scene, but we have it saved on our project and we can edit it there as well. That's actually better than what I was doing before where we have it embedded inside of the uh, scene. So now it's saved to the project, but we get a new duplicate for each invader. So awesome, that's uh, pretty much what we're looking for. Um, we can go to object stats and remove the breakpoint now because we know it's working. So now we can uh, run our project again and just test. So all of them should be able to play their animations when they run out of health. So I think it would make sense for the projectile to just do a bit more damage. So I'll go into the projectile scene hitbox. We'll change the uh, weapon stat basic and change that to 25. So because this is saved to the project and saved inside of the fireable basic TRES, if we click in here and we see the stats, well, we've updated the stats 
So this references the weapon stats basic on the hard drive, and we already updated that, so it updates here as well, because this is just a reference to that object in the project. So oh well, good. Our projectile now does 25 damage, so that would mean four hits to deal 100. And so, of course, we still have a bunch of work here to do. It's kind of boring if we just hit them and nothing happens, so we probably want some knockback, and maybe we can have the characters flash red when uh, they get hit, so more of an indication about what's happening. And after they play the death animation for maybe a second or so, they should remove themselves from the scene. So we'll continue with all of that in the next video. I've been Chris. I hope you guys are enjoying the series so far on the Projectile Platformer 1-Bit series. So we'll continue all of that in the next video or two. If you need the project snapshots, again, you can find them in the description from Ko-Fi or Patreon. And until the next video, I've been Chris. Thanks for watching, and I will see you then.